Lord, we thank you for the truths that we've just sung. Thank you that you indeed do have the words of eternal life. Uh, May we turn to them now. May you speak to us through them. uh, And may we see your glory revealed in them. Amen. Do take a seat. And do keep your Bibles open on Mark chapter 11 um, on page 1015 in the church Bibles. Well, as has been said, uh, my name is Rob Searle, uh, and I'm one of the members here at Cornerstone. Um, In fact, as many of you will know, I've been at Cornerstone since I arrived in Nottingham as a student uh, in 2020, four years ago now. I remember my first day as a student very vividly. I'd been amazed by the sheer size and greenness of the campus at the University of Nottingham on the open day. Uh, And the facilities were, in my eyes, state-of-the-art. The The maths building, where I would be studying, was beautifully designed. And the sports village had an abundance of sporty activities to offer wide-eyed students like me. I knew from the previous October that this would be the place where I'd be studying. And I was just so excited. So when that first day came, there were some nerves, of course, as there were for everyone. But for the most part, I was raring to go, ready to make lifelong friends, and ready to live a more independent life away from home. The day was finally here, and I expected to fit smoothly in to university life in Nottingham. But there was a catch, and some of you will have picked up on it already. My first days in Nottingham were in September 2020, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and when there were some strong restrictions imposed on general life in the UK. The first few days, they were okay in terms of relationship building, but I quickly realized that university would not be what I expected it to be. In fact, everything I was looking forward to about university seemed to not quite live up to what I'd hoped for. Clubs and societies were mostly run online, meaning building deep relationships with anyone there was nearly impossible. The size and the greenness of the campus couldn't be enjoyed in the ways I had hoped for due to the rule of six. Even the maths building was off limits. Biggest of all, though, was the anxiety that arose from being surrounded by the threat of disease. This meant that all I truly felt safe doing was staying in my room watching lectures by myself, and then unwinding by myself too. Of course, this was independence in some form, but as I'm sure you can imagine, it was mostly miserable. I was left feeling betrayed and robbed of the experiences I'd hoped for. Over the past few weeks, we've been spending some time in Mark's Gospel, and we've now established that Jesus is the King. But now we're asking the question, What kind of king is he? Last week, we saw that he has come to serve, which isn't really what you'd expect from a king. This week, we meet some people who have certainly placed uh, a slightly different form of expectation on him. But, like me and my university experience, they don't quite get what they'd hoped for. However, as we explore this passage a little deeper, I hope we'll see that what we do get is far greater than anything they could have imagined. Three points this evening. Point one, a king who comes peacefully. A king who comes peacefully. Throughout this series, we've been following Jesus and his disciples on their journey to Jerusalem. We've seen Jesus open the eyes of the blind, drive out evil spirits, and heal many illnesses. And all the way through this gospel, these acts have earned Jesus the reputation uh, of being a person capable of many miracles. Now, they finally arrived in Jerusalem, where they received quite the welcome. Uh, Let's read from verse 7. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, many people spread their cloaks on the road, 
while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Clearly, the Jews in Jerusalem are delighted to see him. If you turn in your Bibles to Zechariah chapter 9, we would read in verse 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus wants others to see him as this promised king from Zechariah. This passage then is in many ways Jesus' coronation parade. Think back to the coronation uh, of King Charles a couple of years ago. The same thing. It's worth saying at this point uh, that Jerusalem was suffering greatly under Roman occupation um, at this moment in time. While While they were allowed to worship freely, Israel was a nation without its independence. Its people longed for the glory days of the Old Testament. They longed to rule themselves once again. That is the context for Jesus' arrival. So let's recap. Jesus has arrived in Jerusalem. Many people there see him, rightly, as God's promised king from long ago. He's also known to be very powerful because of his miracle-working reputation. And we have a people group that are desperate for a king of their very own, so they can rule themselves once again and be rid of the Romans once and for all. You can feel the expectation in the air. Surely, Jesus is arriving in conquest to overthrow the Romans and restore Israel its sovereignty. In fact, just this morning, we heard of an attempt in John's gospel to make Jesus king by force for this very purpose. That's why the Jews there shout in verse 10, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. David was king of Israel back in Israel's heyday, and the Jews are expectantly waiting for the Messiah to bring those glory days back. And here... Jesus does seem to be the Messiah that they're waiting for. Only, this isn't quite what Jesus has come to do. Let's keep reading in Zechariah uh, 9, uh, from verse 10 this time. It's on the screen. I, that's God, will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. You see, I don't think the people in Jerusalem quite understand the significance of the cult. If we reread the first six verses of our passage this evening, you'd see that Mark goes into great detail in talking about this cult and how the disciples found it. It's clear that it is a deliberate choice by Jesus to arrive on this cult. The Jews think that the Messiah, the promised king, will bring peace through conquest by overpowering the Romans. But I think if that were true, the prophecy would depict him arriving on a war horse or a chariot or something along those lines. Jesus arriving on the back of a cult points to the real reason why Jesus came to Jerusalem. Rather than start a revolution, Jesus was there uh, to get rid of far greater enemies, sin and death. And he did this by dying on the cross in our place. In fact, he proved that he was victorious over death by rising from the dead three days later. And he sought, um, sorry, Jesus was the Messiah And he sought to bring peace by overthrowing Israel's enemies. But not quite in the way that the Jews expected him to. Jesus came to bring peace with God, restoring the relationship between humanity and our creator. 
This is the kingdom Jesus was kick-starting, one free of sin and death. Maybe you've come to Jesus hoping or even expecting him uh, to heal you of your illness or maybe bring you financial prosperity. Maybe you've come along this evening expecting to hear some simple words of wisdom from Jesus and be taught a few nice things about how to act towards others. In fact, maybe you've come to Jesus and have felt let down that these kind of things haven't actually happened to you. Well, if any of that is you, then quite frankly, I think we can set our expectations much higher. Jesus came to establish a new kingdom that has been washed clean of sin and death. We can look to him and be satisfied uh, that he has already won that ultimate victory. And we are all invited to participate in this future kingdom, regardless of our sinful pasts. So how does Jesus go about building his kingdom? What are his first acts as king? Again, they're probably not what we'd expect. Point two, a king who comes to judge. Jesus has entered Jerusalem, but he's briefly headed back out of the city with his disciples. Let's read on from verse 12 in our passage this evening. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Expectations have never been higher of Jesus. He's just arrived in Jerusalem, seemingly as this promised king from the Old Testament. And we've just seen that he was there to rid the world of sin and death, which was even better than what the inhabitants were expecting him to do. So why respond by cursing a fig tree, especially when it isn't even the season for figs? Now, I don't think Jesus is angry because at that moment he was craving figs and was left disappointed. No, I think Jesus curses it because it is all show and no substance. It appears from the outside as though it's doing great. It's doing all the right things. It's bearing lots of fruit. But in reality, it isn't. And that's where the problem lies. Mark has cleverly structured this narrative around the clearing out of the temple courts. So let's keep reading uh, from verse 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. I will not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. Jesus says in this bit of the passage that the temple is a den of robbers, which is a reference to a passage in, in a Jeremiah. We won't turn there now, uh, but Jeremiah stands at the temple gates condemning Israel for feeling secure in their faith simply because of the temple, God's dwelling place. They felt that having the temple in their midst gave them liberty to steal, murder, basically do whatever they want. Because, of course, they could then simply go to the temple for forgiveness. That's what God is there for, right? You can read more about that in, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 7. But on the outside, all looked good. They had the temple, of course. And that was where God dwelt on earth. So like the fig tree, it was a case of all show and no substance. 
the Jews looked good on the outside, but in reality, they didn't have the right heart, the right attitude towards God and his people. They weren't bearing the right fruit. And by comparing his contemporaries to those back in Jeremiah, Jesus is saying that nothing's really changed. The temple has become a market with people going there to make a quick book rather than worship the God of the universe and where people love money more than they love God. Instead of a den of robbers, it should be a house of prayer for all nations. So what is the response? Let's keep reading. We're at verse 19 now, verse 19. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. The fig tree wasn't bearing fruit, even though from the outside it appeared as though it was. Consequently, Jesus brings judgment upon it. The temple, representative of all Israel, can expect the same fate. Jesus didn't come just to get rid of the Romans, but to overcome sin and death. And that includes the sin even in their own hearts. Not quite what you'd expect, is it? This is a stark reminder that we, too, are worthy of judgment and ultimately fall short of God's perfect standard. Even if on the outside we might appear as though we've got it under control, as though we're bearing the right spiritual fruit, deep down, that isn't true. Jesus' kingdom is one that is completely rid of all sin and death, as we've said, and that includes yours and mine. And in that sense, we're exactly like the people Jesus is talking about here. That said, I think this is really good news. You see, being a Christian isn't a box-ticking exercise. Jesus isn't interested in how our faith appears on the inside. That's not why he came. He has come because he wants a relationship with us. He wants to hear our voice. He knows us, but he wants us to know him too. And this looks like prayer which is something we read about in the next part of our passage. Point three, the king who wants a relationship with his people. Let's read uh, what Jesus has to say in verse 22 uh, on to the end. Have faith in God, Jesus answered. Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go, throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sins. Now, I think it's very easy to read this and think, I don't have enough faith. I've definitely read it that way in the past. But the implications for this are quite scary. You can imagine someone with a serious illness could read this and think that they're suffering simply because they don't have enough faith. Rest assured, though, that's not what this passage is saying. Douglas Sean O'Donnell put it well when he wrote, These verses indeed teach that God will answer our prayers but not as a result of positive thinking. Jesus' statement here was not a blank check. To pray effectively, you need faith in the Lord. Not faith in yourself, or faith in your own faith, or faith in the object of your request. Faith in God means trusting his will for our lives and being secure in the fact that he is in control thinking along the lines of, if only I pray hard enough, then I'll get whatever I want, is actually, I would argue, placing our faith in ourselves and thinking that we know what is best for our lives. 
when in reality, we don't. That's not to say we shouldn't pray. Jesus illustrates the power of prayer vividly here with his uh, mountain in the sea uh, illustration. But we should pray with faith in God. This is the fruit that we're called to bear. In fact, this is a king who wants us, who wants to hear our voice, who wants us to pray. Having faith in God, like Jesus says early in verse 22, allows us to enjoy a relationship with him. That means that we can share in Jesus' triumph over sin and death, and that we don't need to fear his judgment. Because of this, a relationship with Jesus is better than anything this world has to offer, and better than anything we could ever expect. When I first realized this, it was like everything suddenly clicked into place. I've really struggled when it comes to comparing myself to others, especially when it comes to faith, or, or rather how my faith is appearing to other people. Even preparing this sermon recently has been a real challenge in that area at times, comparing myself to others. So knowing that Jesus isn't concerned with our outward faith appearance, so to speak, but actually wants a relationship with us, it was like a burden was lifted from my shoulders. Instead of working on how our faith appears to those around us, we can trust fully that a relationship with Jesus means we are spared judgment and can be a part of Jesus' kingdom. I expected my time at university to be brilliant. My expectations were super high going in, and I was so excited to see them materialize. But things didn't quite go how I imagined. Instead, I encountered adversity and anxiety, and very quickly, my expectations became very low. In that sense, I'm just like the Jews in Jerusalem who expected Jesus to kick out the Romans, but instead came face to face with a king who would bring judgment, and worse still, judgment on them. But even though things started out by being worse than I expected, I was lucky enough to make some really long-lasting friendships and discover a lot more of what God had in store for my life than I would have ever thought possible. As a result, I have been able to build the most important relationship of them all with God himself. My time in Nottingham has brought me significantly closer to God, and I'm more excited than ever to follow him and be a part of his kingdom. And whatever your expectations are of Jesus this evening, I think we can know too that you too are invited into that most important relationship of all with God. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, so much that you are not quite what we expect. We thank you that you are so much more than that. We thank you that even though uh, we have a very sinful past, all of us, we thank you that you invite each and every one of us to participate in your kingdom and to have a relationship with you. And we pray that where we might struggle with things that have been raised this evening, um, we pray that you remind us of that, that ultimately a relationship with you is the most important thing of all. Amen.